defense. And I also, well, that's, these are my main roles right now. Outside of, outside of work, I would give you an idea of what I, I'm more into, uh, you'd probably find me out in nature and exploring the wonders of nature and the wildlife therein. I got involved in um, the park systems. I, I spent so much time outside and at a certain point of uh, my life, I started pumping into volunteers and, and park workers and I got involved as a volunteer in a park system and I started doing interpretation. As uh, if you're familiar with the park system, there's the interpretation department. And I did some um, um, natural resource management where we keep the lands out of the invasive plants. I did natural resource uh, uh, protection and the wildlife therein. And I did um, belong to an archaeological society. And I do the wildlife. Uh, wildfire protection in California, which is a huge problem right now. And this is something that I really want to use data, data to solve. So sure. uh, that's a quick introduction. I'm sorry if I take too long. <laughs> no, 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 it's totally fine. Um, I, I, I'm going to kick it over to Ashwara. Um, she comes to us from Google Cloud AI, um, who a group that we have worked with, uh, at least in my experience at Disney, uh, in various capacities. So would you be able to just give yourself a quick two to three minute intro? Uh, so yeah, as you introduced, I'm part of uh, part of the Google Cl Cloud AI team right now. Um, I recently joined Google, before which I was with IBM for the past three years. Um, in my most recent role at IBM, I was uh, AI and ML innovation leader, where I was uh, working on market research and doing industry research on how organizations can operationalize uh, AI solutions and how does it really map to their uh, to their business goals. So that, that's what I was doing. And presently at Google, I am working as a data scientist uh, trying to implement Google AI solutions to, uh, to customer ends. And uh, outside of work, I am really passionate about writing um, about like data science and AI. So I have started this nonprofit organization called Illuminate AI, which is a mentorship platform where uh, people who are interested to grow their careers in uh, data science and AI can seek mentorship. So there's uh, an application process that they have to go through. And we also provide a lot of free resources on, um, on, on like, you know, industrial use cases of AI. So one of the motivations that I had to start this was um, because I saw a gap between what's there in academia versus how hard uh, it is, you know, to build uh, these AI solutions and scale them and operationalize them in industry. So I sort of wanted to create more awareness on how we can do that. And also like, how can uh, business stakeholders uh, build a roadmap to implementing AI in their workflow? So yeah, that's a brief introduction about me. Awesome, thank you, Ashwarya. Um, and then finally, we have Logan coming to us from the hallowed halls of Cupertino and Apple. So Logan, would you care to uh, give us a brief intro? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll just make a really quick legal disclaimer that everything I said today is, is sort of representing my own personal opinions and views, and I'm, I'm not an official representative or, or speaking on behalf of Apple. I just always have to give my disclaimer because the legal folks at Apple are uh, just the best in the world. So um, yeah, really so I'm, a, I'm an applied machine learning engineer at Apple. Uh, previously, I was, uh, I've been doing this in this specific role for the last year. Uh, before that was, was a software engineer at Apple um, doing a bunch of uh, more cloud related activities. Um, outside of the, the role that I have at Apple where I focus on computer vision specifically for the retail stores, um, I'm also the developer community advocate for the Julia programming language, which is, uh, if folks aren't familiar, a language that's very similar to uh, Python, for example. Um, it's just a lot faster and um, more predominantly used in scientific applications. And then also sort of in the same vein in the open source world, um, I'm on the board of directors at a nonprofit called NumFocus, and NumFocus is the it's the organization behind some of the really large open source projects that you might have heard of, like Jupyter, Pandas, NumPy, um, Julia also are all part of that um, focus umbrella. Um, so yeah, really excited to be here. I think this will be a ton of fun and uh, looking forward to hopefully answering questions at the end as well. Awesome. Thank you, Logan. So I think that there's, um, Mo, you're raising your hand. 
Yeah, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I'm going to second Logan's. I, I want to add a disclaimer. Everything I'm about to say is represent me and my personal view. I don't represent any organization, so just second that. <laughs> awesome. All right. Now that we've gotten, now that we've all cleared non-disclosure, uh, we'll, move, uh, we'll move forward. Um, I think we all kind of gathered here to, to touch on a few things, but one of the things that I think is just a natural sort of springboard um, obviously coming from larger enterprise companies, whether it's Apple, whether it's Google, in my case, Disney, and then, and, you know, being a, a consultant and advisor to these, to these firms, the way that Mo is, uh, one of the things that I see most commonly in organizations is this kind of notion that there is artificial intelligence and machine learning. These concepts are buzzwords, but the application of them is, let's, let's call it abstract, right? So, there is this notion that we have this technology, we're a big enterprise company, we know that we have tools available to leverage some of the benefits of ML, AI, um, and even you know, larger scale data processing. But most of the time when I'm talking to people from outside of my organization, there's this notion that like, we don't know how to implement it, right? Or we know how to implement it at a very high level, but there's this disconnect between what we're getting as far as business value uh, versus what we're sort of doing as a data science experiment. So I guess, you know, one of the things that I'd like to ask this group is what are your experiences in implementing technology like this at scale, both internally and then, you know, to the extent that you network with colleagues, what are some of the biggest problems that you have heard people bring up when it comes to implementing um, newer forms of data science analytics. Um, you know, I, I think it would be good to start with maybe uh, say Logan, since I uh, came, I came around to you last in the, uh, the introduction phase. Obviously, Apple is a company that works with a lot of external clients to sort of bring their technology to the forefront. Um, do you see that sort of gap between the knowledge of the technology versus the application of it? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I think the biggest disconnect I see is the, and you know, not to say bad things about folks on the business side, but I think a lot of people on the sort of business side of companies have this idea of what artificial intelligence and machine learning can actually do. And then I think there's the engineers on the team who are all sort of very aware of the limitations and what's required to actually make some of these projects work. And I think that's, I, I, in my role right now, I spend a probably at least 25% of my time just working with our customers and our stakeholders to continually reinforce the ideas of, you know, what are the expectations we can set with respect to these machine learning projects? What are the actual limitations? What do we need from you in order to make these projects successful? Um, and again, I think that's probably 25% of the time. And another 15% of the time is just working with these teams, the business teams to actually help define the problem. I think people sometimes have this like very vague understanding of what they're actually trying to solve. And they're like, oh, we have this problem. We can just take machine learning and just all of a sudden things will solve and life will be great. And that's just very far from reality. Like you really need a very constrained solution in order to, or a constrained problem in order to apply machine learning to it. I think that's a great point. And, and one of the things as I'm an associate at Columbia that I try to stress to the students, the graduate students that are taking our courses is that this is ultimately a collaborative effort. You, you need to get to a point where you can define at a baseline what you're going to be targeting as far as results and then go from there versus just saying, well, we have a bunch of algorithms and we're gonna throw them into the wind and see kind of what sticks. Um, and I'd love to hear, Ashwarya, because you're working with Google Cloud AI, I imagine you see a lot of similar use cases, whether it's, you know, trying to articulate certain benefits of your technology platform to uh, third parties or even trying to implement them. So I'm really curious to hear your thoughts here too. Uh, sure. So one of the, um, sorry, uh, can you hear me? Awesome. Uh, yeah. So one of the challenges that I do feel uh, with, you know, like operationalizing um, AI use cases in industry. So the challenge that we see is, for business, businesses to articulate how this is going to uh, bring them revenue, right? For any business, the bottom line is going to be like, hey, how much revenue are we generating every year? 
And when they are investing in building AI platforms, there is a overhead of uh, investment that they are making into it, not just as an initial cost, but also as a um, recurring cost, right? Like if they're using cloud solutions or going deciding to go with like on-prem on solutions, they have this uh, recurring cost every month. So they have to really understand the math of like, how much revenue is it going to generate us in excess if we are going to invest in this technology? Or how is it really helping us to grow our business if not if impacting the revenue directly? So that's one of the challenges that I see uh, that there is a gap because um, when uh, ML practitioners or like data science practitioners are getting in touch with business stakeholders, uh, there's this gap of understanding their business. We do understand technology really well, but we do not have full picture of, of, you know, like the businesses which they are running or like how many business unit, what business verticals, how many employees for that matter, like, right? So that's the gap which, uh, which a lot of companies are trying to bridge. And I believe that's also a responsibility from the like technology people that we should understand the business perspective. We should wear their hat uh, for some time and see that, you know, like how is our model going to impact them rather than just, proposing a really fancy uh, state-of-the-art model to them. I think that's a great point. And you actually touched on something that I think is really relevant. And that's that depending on the company that you're working for, there is this notion of legacy architecture versus something uh, more modern, whether it's Google Cloud, whether it's IBM and, and the whole Watson thing or AWS. Um, I quite often hear that one of the biggest challenges in sort of bridging that gap is getting teams that have been more accustomed to on-prem, bare metal, that sort of thing, to really understand that moving towards a more AI and data-driven solution, especially if it's in the cloud, uh, is ultimately going to be for the benefit of everybody. But there seems to be, and this is just my experience dealing with companies in the past outside of my current one, um, there seems to be this almost siloing in which there is a group that is very protective of what they have already stood up and their role in the overall workflow and infrastructure. Um, have you experienced this, Mo? I'll kick this over to you. Um, wondering your thoughts here about bridging that gap, right? Because I think that there's this notion that we need to be collaborative and we need to find a way to communicate to every team that these solutions, once we've established the baseline goals with the business unit are ultimately going to benefit everybody's work and everybody's workload. So what are some things that you think that these legacy businesses can do when they're really trying to move from maybe a more on-prem solution to something that's a bit more cloud-based and obviously leveraging things like ML and AI? This is for me, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's a good question. And I would start my answer. I would draw my answer from my big picture kind of research stuff. So I would start by saying that our current infrastructure is not built for algorithmic and robotic consumption. Our uh, cloud, uh, cloud infrastructure became massive in like 2015, 2016. We are still early on, super early on. Whatever we have developed was developed for human consumption. And there's a difference between human consumption and robotic consumption. There's velocity, there's volume to the data. There's a, there's a ton of differences. And all these new solutions, you know, all these machine learning and deep learning frameworks, like uh, even GitHub, all these new technologies that we take for granted as a data scientist or AI engineer or scientist, they started around 2015, 2016. Do you think an industry can transform in five or six or seven years? It cannot. Even undergrad uh, programs at major university like Carnegie Mellon or different schools, they started also around that time. So we're still in a new discipline. We're still in a transformational phase. And I was, I was in a meeting the other day. I was attending a conference actually with business people. And I believe it was James Menika. He's a distinguished robotic uh, scientist, uh, consultant, McKinsey senior executive. He said that for every dollar, and these people know about organizational transformation, for every dollar that you make on an investment, you have to invest an additional $20 in 
ch change management. And as you all mentioned, it's it's vague right now. No, but people feel like, what do we do? How do we do this? It's it's very difficult to implement AI into the current workflows because they were designed in a silos, like you said. So um, I think we have to start by pulling teams together. It's multidisciplinary. We have to have computer scientists. We have to have psychologists, linguists, philosophers. There's a lot that goes on. So. Earn a lot of challenges, and I think a first step is for companies to invest more and find the right investment, not just to build, to get the fancy tools, but to um, build a long term project. That's like how I feel right now about implementation. That's great. Thank you. Um, and I think that touches on the broader uh, topic at hand, which is that we are now entering into this phase in which you're going to see this new generation of employee that is going to either come into the workforce with an embedded knowledge of you know big data uh, ai ml these sort of concepts um, and then they are sort of going to have to meld and start to bridge gaps between employees that are maybe still making that transition and just learning and getting familiar with the technology um, so i guess one of the questions that I get the most from our students at Columbia is, how do I go about speaking to non-technical teams about the benefits of what we can bring to the table with these newer methodologies? Um, specifically because, as um, Aishwara mentioned, there is a cost associated with it. And, and Mo, you said that too. And it's, it's non-negligible in many cases, especially as you get bigger and bigger. Um, I've always said that if you can define a product deliverable that is backed by what you are looking to implement from a technology standpoint, that can help. So in the, I'll just give an example. In the case of Disney Plus, recommend, or even Netflix, Amazon, recommendation engines, right? That's one of the most common use cases that we see. And from there, you start thinking about things like user engagement, right? User retention. And these are things that make sense to maybe the more non-technical teams that you're interfacing with. Um, any advice for people who just kind of need um, a more, I, I don't wanna say high level um, overview of the benefits here, but like, you know, just something that can be defined in business terms. I would love to hear Logan, maybe uh, get your thoughts here because obviously Apple does so much with consumer facing products and the technology that backs them. Yeah, no, this is this is interesting. I think it's one of the, the fundamental challenges, again, of being a machine learning engineer and, and working with folks who are sort of outside of that discipline. I think it, for me personally, the approach that I take is um, I don't use any of the sort of industry specific lingo. And whenever we're in our meetings, like I'm not talking about, you know, the, the machine learning approaches that we're taking. I'm not talking about the model names, like all those sort of things are the internal conversations with the other machine learning engineers on my team. And I think the difficult part is going back and forth, like back to back meetings where it's one team of all machine learning people. The next team is like all our business people and like having to make that mental switch between and like remember that, hey, I need to talk about these things in a different way, I think is a challenge. And the other piece too is uh, making the results of the machine learning work that you're doing actually digestible. And, and I think per, for myself personally, I need to do a better job of this. Like our, our team always, you know, presents people with confusion matrices of like the results. And I'm like, you know, that's probably not the best way that we want these teams to be digesting the results of our, of our ML models. So um, that, that's another huge piece of it. And it's something that, again, is, is always a work in progress of figuring out the best way to sort of share the results that you've, uh, that you've accomplished. Absolutely. Um, I, I know that we are about 25 minutes in, so I want to just quickly move on to uh, your experience getting into this field. Uh, you know, uh, Ashwarya, I'll start with you. Did you kind of enter your professional life as a, a like just a dedicated data scientist, or was it something that you sort of found yourself getting into? Because another question that we get quite often from students is, I come from, say, um, a, a product management background, or I come from um, even, say, a, a marketing background, and I have this notion of these technologies that I would love to leverage. I'd love to be able to sort of 
go more in depth with them, but I don't quite know what the path is to begin to engage with these technologies and even chart a career path that sort of aligns with them. So, you know, what, what were your thoughts there as far as getting into the field? Sure, Brian. So uh, I'll just give a quick uh, preview on like, how did I get into the field of data science? So, and also like for folks who are probably coming from like different fields. So mine was uh, sort of a natural transition because uh, right from high school, I saw my mom who was, who was working in the data analytics field. So it was sort of, you know, like an inclination that I had from the beginning. So um, I used to see her working and that's something that intrigued me a lot. And uh, since high school, I think I was very sure that, hey, I want to like get into the computer science field and I want to specialize in data science and machine learning. And through my undergrad, I was, I was again, like, uh, it just reinforced the fact that I was very interested in the field. I was passionate about it. So I kept following the same field. But that might not be the case with a lot of folks. Um, a lot of people I work with who are, you know, like peers with me, uh, have come from economics background, have come from social science background, um, have come from like mechanical background. So uh, that's one of the things I, I tell people that, you know, your background does not have to restrict you from getting into the field of data science because data science is not computer science. Data science does not need you to just know how to code. There's so many different aspects to data science. Every business that's digitized, every business that's collecting data that has users B2B or B2C, needs data science te technology in their work stream and it needs subject matter experts who can guide them on how to build it the right way so as i think uh, like mohammed was mentioning earlier right like we need different personas in every team and that's where i put this point that we definitely need different personas and that's where we require different expertise different uh, people from different domains who collaborate together and build a uh, build a good solution and I re-emphasize this because we do not just need technology folks, because in the past we have seen AI solutions fail just because we have specifically focused on saying that, hey, this is a technology solution and that's the only thing that we're going to focus on. And that's where we, that's where we have seen solutions fail. That's where we need people who understand the society, who understand where biases can, um, can you know, like trick into the solutions and they can help us uh, avoid making the same mistakes that we have made in the past. I think that's such a great point. And that's kind of just speaking personally, that's sort of how I came into my current role. There was this need to have somebody who could sort of speak both languages, both the engineering language, but then translate that into business and product language in a way that is digestible to a non-technical audience. And so I found myself working deeply in uh, data science and analytics over the past three years, despite not really you know, my undergraduate focus was not anything remotely close to that, even if my graduate focus was. So I think that as the industry and as the, the, the technology evolves, you're going to see these really, really highly demanded roles that sort of facilitate one component of the technology, but are operating in a, a wholly unique, but equally important capacity. Um, Mo, your thoughts here, you know, were you somebody who just came into data science as a kid? Were you, was this something that you kind of found yourself leaning towards after a few experiences in the workplace? Not at all. <laughs> not at all. Not even slightly close. I was, um, I think, I wouldn't say an accident, but I originally wanted to go to law school. And I went to DC because I wanted to go to law school and I start interviewing the law students with uh, like auditing classes. And that's what I wanted to do. But when I got there, I was going to a lot of events and uh, uh, from a meeting with people from various disciplines. And I realized at that moment, I was in a career transition and I realized that all these people had an advantage over me because they had technical skills. And I came from a non-technical background. I had a, a liberal art education. I got my a degree in undergrad in, in business econ. And I realized that I was missing a lot. I looked at the future. I was like, if I'm going to survive this future, I'm going to have to pick up some technical tools. And that's how I started coding. I realized and I'm, I, that's how I got into data science. I just saw so many people using Python or R or like all these tools. And I picked them up and I enjoyed it so much. Uh, so that's how it started for me. And it was also in conjunction with writing. And it was a very, very exciting topic to write about. And I couldn't have found any better topic to 
it kind of naturally led me to this direction, you know? Uh, yeah, I, I can totally see that. Logan, what about you? Did you start out in the, uh, in the data science discipline or did you just kind of find yourself here? Yeah, I, I definitely very much found myself in the in the machine learning data science space. I think it's always something that was interesting to me. Like I think in the context of computer science, like when I was doing undergrad, I took like maybe one AI class and um, it was always something that I thought was cool, but really difficult and also sort of beyond my level of understanding at the time. Yeah. Um, and I was fortunate enough that the, that when I was at Apple, um, the first sort of eight months I was there, I spent as a, as a software engineer and then had the opportunity to actually transition teams and sort of go full in depth um, as a machine learning engineer, even without that background, um, sort of internally, uh, which was a, a great experience for me. So someone was asking about um, thoughts on recommendations for self-taught data scientists. I think I'm, I'm not 100% self-taught, but like definitely very much like didn't do a master's in machine learning or anything like that before I became um, a machine learning engineer. And I think there's, we can talk more about resources later on, but that was sort of the, the path that I took to, to get where I am today. Yeah, I think one of the things that the common theme that I'm hearing from the three of you is that there is, it's, it's, it's overly simplistic in a way, but curiosity is, is the key, right? Because uh, for so many of us, there's this notion that well, we can't, you know, not that we can't work in this realm, but that it's so vastly complicated. There's all these different technical skills and disciplines that are needed. But I think ultimately, um, the way that a lot of people seem to find their way into these roles today, and I'm hearing it from the three of you, and it's very similar for me too, is you identified a problem that needed to be solved. And so long as you can kind of see that problem and the solution, then from there it becomes kind of a matter of re-engineering your skill set to get to that point. That's at least how I've always approached it. Um, I didn't. I majored in film <laughs> in undergrad, and my high school teacher and my high school math teacher in sophomore year highly suggested that I did not go into a a science a scientific field. He said it was not to my strong. It was not one of my strong points. Um, but again, I. As I was working in my, you know, right out of undergrad, I saw a need for automation. We're working in streaming. We want to get it. We want to start figuring out how we can predict user behavior, how we can predict device behavior, things like that. And I just kind of found myself experimenting with whatever platform was available to me at the time, whether it was AWS, um, whether it was just kind of bothering our engineers and seeing if they could kind of uh, enlighten me as to certain aspects. So there's that curiosity factor. And I think that's really key. Um, you know, we are now at this point where I, I, I'm always kind of surprised that I think it was uh, Ashwari, you brought this up. There's not, or no, I think it was Mo, I'm sorry. There's not really a, a curriculum that I see in undergrad that is f at least based on the universities that I've examined that is fully embracing a lot of these components. Like the amount of students that have told me that their universities do not offer anything in the way of um, training in, in say cloud architecture, whether it's Google, whether it's AWS. And it seems to me like such a skill and a skill set that if you are entering the workplace, if you're currently in the workplace dealing in technology, you just need to have an awareness of it. And the fact that so many people seem to not when they get out of undergrad, I always say, in my opinion, that's a big leg up. Where do you see the educational component going in the future, in the, in the very short term? Because this is very new, as Mo was saying. Um, do you see any sort of adjustments to sort of broader undergraduate cur curriculums as people want to get into these fields where they have to sort of tailor what they're learning to the marketplace? And two things like cloud and ML and AI. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, uh, Mo. I really like this question. Thank you so much. I You're think, welcome, Mo. I think that educational institutes can't do anything right now. You know why? Because I was uh, listening to Gary Bowles. He is uh, the chair of Future of Work at Singularity University. And you know why Singularity University can't get uh, accredited programs? Because they change the curriculum. Well, in order to be accredited, you have to keep your curriculum without change for two years. 
and the oh. curriculum changed so much. We're still early on. There is a lot of change, and these. Um, I think that um, the key to education right now, as I saw in the programs offered by schools, I saw like you mentioned. I'm gonna. Uh, I I agree with you that you can find the program that will help you in a workplace at like the school of continuing education, the school of professional studies, the schools that are vocational more than uh, like uh, just going into a major into a, like an undergrad in, in uh, psychology or in computer science or so I think these schools are getting up to speed with picking up the latest tools. I know from interviewing many uh, uh, many people in the academic field that many academics left academia because the tools that were used in academia were uh, outdated. That's a great point. That is a great, so great point. I have a lot of things talk about academia and education, but I'm gonna just wrap it up here and uh, over to you. Uh, I think that's actually, that is a, that is a great point. Um, and it's one of the difficulties that I find in even uh, facilitating an ML and AI class at Columbia, which is that there is a set of tools that the students are given to experiment and they, they work from a theoretical standpoint and they're, they're, totally, they're totally adequate theoretically but that's not necessarily what is is being used out in the wild. And so, you know, even something like the gap between um, a user interface for something that you're using in undergrad or, or, or graduate school versus then going out into the real world and seeing, oh, well, this is what the AWS suite of, of machine learning tools looks like. I feel like it adds a layer of complexity for a person who maybe already feels like they are on the outside looking in. Um, I would love to know, Logan, since Apple, I, I have to assume that you, you've taken a lot, of, a lot of interns, a lot of folks fresh out of undergrad. Do you see that they're coming in with that sort of built-in background that's really prepared to deal with really a lot of what's possible now with, with uh, suites of cloud tools, whether it's Google, whether it's AWS? Um, or do you still kind of find that they're getting, um, I don't want to say a, an old school education, but I can't think of a better term, so I'm going to go with that. No, that's that's interesting. I think, and and you know maybe um, Apple is not the the, and I'm sure Google and some other companies are probably the same way. Where you know the people who end up getting there as far as interns or new grads are like highly filtered to the point where like you know they might actually only choose people who sort of have those experiences already or something like that. But um, in general, I I do think though that there are a lot of folks who are coming in with the with the willingness to learn. Maybe not necessarily specifically who have the skill already, um, but you know. So many folks who I who I work with who are at the intern level or you know fresh grads, um, you know, did a bunch of internships, so they have that practical real world experience. And I really think that's the piece that bridges the gap. Like you can learn, you know, all of whatever the classes that you take in undergrad or graduate school, but if you don't have the experience of actually going and seeing what real companies do and how they solve problems, it doesn't really matter that much. Like you need that experience. And I think for my own life. I, I actually interned at Disney, right? And um, so I, I had that experience of sort of working in, in the real life world. And I had the chance to intern at Apple and, and intern at NASA and all of those different experiences sort of gave me the perspective of how do people actually solve real world problems? And I think that's, I mean, people always say like, that's where you learn the most. And that's probably true. Like I had the sort of foundational fundamental skills um, coming from a, a traditional computer science background and getting to actually apply those in, in the different contexts. I think that's really where the the sort of the light flicked for me was when I sort of got to apply those skills. Um, and, and I think that's the same case for, for a lot of folks. Uh, Ashwari, do you, do you, do you see the same at Google? Uh, I know you, I know you're relatively new there. Sorry to, sorry to jump in, but you know, yeah. even I'll actually like point out two different things here. So um, I'll tell you about the, about the time when I was doing my master's uh, in data science at Columbia. So the courses that we had was covering the foundational elements of data science or machine learning. We were not being taught, how do you use this uh, Python package or how do you use this R package? That, that was not the core of, uh, you know, like what we were learning. Because like 
packages, open source technologies are going to be ever changing. And I do not see how any university can accommodate to, you know, like packages changing every single month, right? So what uh, the curriculum has had focused on was the foundational elements on what I need to know to implement any package in, in the right manner or any package, uh, any algorithm in an uh, efficient manner. So that, that was like, uh, you know, hit at the right spot. The second thing that really helped me was doing a research assistantship. So I worked with uh, Andres Miller. Uh, he, was, he was a professor uh, at uh, Data Science Institute back then. So when I worked with him on, you know, uh, developing more on scikit-learn, that's when I realized that, you know, there was ever-changing trends in scikit-learn. There were like newer models which were coming up. Then we had changing parameters. We had different kinds of hyperparameters. We had so many things which were changing all the time that we had to sort of, you know, accommodate for those changes in the upcoming packages. And that's where something I realized that, you know, like you cannot really have a perfect product or like a perfect package at any point in time. That's always going to be changing. So that... Uh, RA sort of gave me a lot of perspective from how these packages are used by different folks in the industry and um, a lot of, you know, like real world experience, I would say. The other thing that really helped me, and I, I believe it's a great uh, addition to the curriculum, was the capstone project, which we had in the final semester. And for that, I was working with Goldman Sachs. And when we worked on the project, uh, something we realized is that data science or the ML part that we often talk about is like, teeny tiny 20 percent of the entire workflow there were so many things that we had to learn about goldman sachs about what problem are we solving and i was reading some pharmaceutical research papers for the purpose of it like i have no background whatsoever in pharma or medical or finance for that matter so that sort of gave me a lot of perspective on what you need to learn before you are jumping onto a problem and I have spent like three and a half years in the industry, like doing this, but till date, I have not experienced any project where I am like, Hey, okay. I know the, pro I know the problem and I can jump onto the jump on solving it because every problem is very different. Every company, every use case is so different that you have to research. You have to, you know, like, um, try to ask the right questions. So something I have learned is never put your brain to work on the solution right away. Ask a lot of questions, ask a lot of clarifications, ask a lot of, uh, you know, uh, things that you're, that is going to help you build that solution rather than jumping on to build the solution right away. So that's one section and followed by the second question that you had about, you know, like my, the tool, tool sets that I'm using at Google. While I was transitioning from IBM, I was working on IBM's cloud AI. I have transitioned to Google cloud AI, which is, you know, so, sort of like sounds very similar but there is so many things that is different because there's there's a lot of architectural differences. There's a lot of uh, code-based differences. There's a lot of difference in how the UI looks like or how do we interact with the system or how does the processes work in Google versus what, what, what was there at IBM, right? So there's always this upskilling that happens every time I'm going to switch a job or every time I'm going to start working on new technology, that upskilling is going to happen. And as Logan mentioned, you know, like, I see like when Google or any other company hires, they're not hiring for the skill set that you have right now. They are going to hire you for the ability of yeah. having the skills grow in, in the upcoming future. And so that's that's what I believe. And I think that's a great point too. And I think the the notion of um, just the, the differences between these different uh, suites, whether it's IBM or Google, this is why a lot of companies would love to have um, cloud redundancy amongst several providers, right? You'd love to have it amongst, uh, you know, if your primary is Google, then maybe you have a backup with Amazon, but it, in many ways, you're kind of speaking a different language. And there are a lot of assumptions that you should not be bringing from one into the other. Um, I know that we have about 15 minutes left. I do want to get some time in for Q&A. Uh, it looks like we have a bunch of questions in the chat. Um, so I, I know that we, we've been filtering some that have been coming through. So maybe we can get uh, uh, the first question for the group. Sure, so uh, there's several questions. Thank you everyone for inputting your, your questions. The first one is if you have any recommendations for self-taught data scientists. For, um, so for your self-taught data scientists? Yes, yeah, so any resources, any tools, any Anything that is would be helpful to to learn um, data science on your by yourself. 
No, go ahead. I, I have a thought here too, but I want to let you go first. Oh, okay. Thank you. I, I really like this question. And I think that for a new data scientist, I am considering myself a new data scientist. And I still consider myself a newbie. I've been doing it for three years and I uh, was uh, got an advice from uh, someone who was an expert. He said, uh, Mohammed, be patient with yourself, be gentle and uh, take your time. He said, he, he gave me a really nice analogy. He said, um, take your data science career as a long hike. I'm, I'm, I think I'm quoting him right now, maybe not, work, but he said, but the longest hike in the world is from the southern tip of Africa to the eastern coast of Russia. And that hike takes about three and a half years if you if you if you're to walk it at a good pace. And he said, take your data science career as a longer hike than that. And I can't agree anymore. Be patient if you're learning data science, if you're new to it, because it's multidisciplinary. I spent uh, first two years, I learned some topics about statistics, about math, about uh, computer science, about uh, data science, machine learning. And I'm going back, I'm taking more math and more linear algebra. And I think also find a mentor because there's a vastness of resources out there. It's a huge, like open source academic institution it's easy to get lost so if you are starting fresh find someone who can help you with finding the path if you're self-taught that's great you can learn it all on your own but find someone to give you what you specifically need if you want to do machine learning you want to learn different things than if you want to do more like uh, more data science and data engineering so uh, navigating those resources and taking your time don't rush into it i would i still gonna take i still have years of education ahead of me right. and i'm gonna draw it from multiple disciplines so that's uh, my advice and over to you i think i think that's great advice and i i would say from a, a sort of a hands-on experience perspective there are a variety of tools that you can leverage either for free or you know with a, an associated cost i have found personally that something like a quick labs q w i k l a b s um, has for uh, both free and for a subscription tier it, it walks you through the various suites of um, ml and ai <clears throat> um, sort of service providers, whether the, whether it's Google Cloud, whether it's uh, IBM, whether it's AWS, they give you a, an environment and a guided sort of step-by-step -step process where you can get your hands on some of this technology, um, start architecting some workflows, start getting a feel for the terminology for what the different interfaces look like. Um, and you do it all within an ecosystem that's do no harm. And I think that's the big thing too. So you can just kind of mess around um, you get robust feedback as to you know where there are gaps in your work um, and it's all very self it's self-paced um, but i found it to be a hugely valuable resource because it's always being updated um, and it's something you can always go back to and kind of get your hands uh, dirty with a, a new tool or a new concept so um logan uh, ashwara any any thoughts here the only point that i'll add is that it really figure out like what the best way that you learn is like, I think for me, I, I cannot learn self-paced stuff for the sake of learning self-paced stuff. Like I really need a, a tangible problem that I'm trying to solve or some actionable thing, or I need sort of the, the infrastructure that like a traditional um, education institution would provide. So I think when I'm really trying to like, I'm, I'm learning law stuff right now, and I needed that sort of educational infrastructure to help push me through that because I sort of didn't have anything practical. Like I'm, I don't have any legal problems in my life that I need to solve. So I think having that sort of figuring out what works best for you and, and finding those resources, there's a thousand different courses and, and websites that, that all teach you data science. So really figure out that point first and then go and sort of survey all the tools that are out there. Yeah. Great point. Ashwarya, any, any thoughts? Um, yeah, sure. So um, things are sort of like a little different for me. Um, I like to read um, about data science or machine learning, even if it's outside of my work. So um, most of my bookshelf is full of books, which is related to like AI or things. So the recent book that I got was uh, from this author, Shanta Mohan. Um, she wrote a book with, you know, like her chapter about uh, how AI is applicable in retail. 
So again, like as my background was in computer science followed by data science, I'm very interested to learn about like how do different industries grow and how do they, how can they, you know, like leverage AI solutions. So I'm just interested in reading those kind of things. Some of those things end up uh, being used in my work. Some of things, some of those don't, but I, I feel like that sort of like helps my, um, helps like increase my knowledge. Uh, and that's, that's what I, uh, I try to do. Uh, yeah, there's, there's no like end goal that I'm trying to seek, but it's just like, you know, learning, uh, learning new things in just the space of data science and AI. So yeah, that's just my, my way of learning. Uh, I am again, like not, not a person who's very fascinated with the certifications because I feel sometimes, you know, uh, when I've, when I've suggested these to my mentees that, Hey, this certification is really nice. The course, what I mean is the course course material is really nice for the certification, but people just end up focusing on that. Hey, I just need that piece of paper, which says that I'm good at something rather than focusing on really learning the drilling the course material that's given to them so that that's one of the reasons i'm not a big fan of certifications so i just i just recommend people that just read things which is of, of your interest not everybody can have the same interest not everybody can have the same strengths and weaknesses in the skills so there is no one you know one size fits all kind of a resource that i can share um, what i have done is for foundational items, I have sort of created this uh, page where I have listed down 22 weeks of, you know, going through the foundational items of uh, before you get into like data science or machine learning. So I can definitely share that link with people who are interested. Those are again, like just the foundational items, things which you need to know and things which you should be good at before you are uh, planning to like build a career in data science. If you are specifically interested in any particular field or any spe specific technology, then that's an additional thing that you have to, you know, research for yourself and read, read uh, what, what intrigues you. Great, great. Do we have another question? Yeah, I think we can fit in one last question. Um, and this question is about how companies can deal with different types of data. So I think in our program, we've seen how companies may struggle to use their data because it's unstructured, it's not centralized, and then how to interpret it to make decisions. Um, and we know companies have different types of data. They have time series, no SQL, semi-structured and whatnot. So in your organizations, how do you deal with, or with this problem, mainly having multiple types of data and making sense of all the different types of data and actually using them to make decisions? That's a great question. Um, I, I could speak for about two hours on this, but I, I'll kick it over to you. Uh, Logan, what are your thoughts here? I saw your expression when the question came up and I was like, that's, that's where I'm headed with this. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the dirty secret about any data science machine learning uh, job or, or team or whatever is that you're going to spend a lot of your time working with data. Like I, I've actually spent probably uh, the project that I'm on, I, I think I had probably a two month period where I did absolutely no machine learning and it was 100% focused on let's make sure that we have the right data to actually solve this problem. And I think that's that's the trend that you'll see across like real like in sort of an academic research setting. Um, when you're doing machine learning, you are really blessed because you can just sort of make use of all these publicly available data sets and take them and go and solve machine learning problems. And, and that's like the, the maybe fun and exciting part of machine learning, but the real work is getting all that data ready set up. And, and as far as how to handle it, from my perspective, I just do computer vision. So I um, only work with the images and I, I don't really have to deal with any of those other types of data. So maybe someone else can answer if you're working with multiple data streams, but data is is 80% of the time you're going to spend working with data and 20% of the time you're going to spend training models, trying to understand and, and actually uh, garner value from that data. Yeah, uh, what are your thoughts, uh, Aishwarya? I imagine that being at Google, you see data coming in in every conceivable manner. So what are your thoughts on how to handle um, just the different data streams coming in, the different structures? So as Logan mentioned that we definitely spend a lot of time in, you know, like data pre-processing, building the data engineering pipelines. So when you see that, you know, there's a streaming data, uh, like streaming data coming from a particular source, you have to build a pipeline that 
uh, like does the ETL process, does the pre-processing on that data. So that uh, definitely takes a major chunk of the time. And secondly, when it comes to, you know, building the machine learning pipeline, what's more important is that we do not keep reinventing the wheel. So that's one of the places where we use existing APIs or, you know, existing packages that helps us uh, not to reinvent the wheel. So for example, if I'm working on text data in Google, like uh, we would preferably try to use document AI and try to figure out what are the existing solutions on which you know ML researchers have spent years working on and use those uh, and tune them uh, in terms of like wherever we need custom uh, custom solutions. So that's that's typically how we would deal with uh, with such kind of data. And uh, Mo, what are your thoughts here? Since we have a few minutes left, I, I want to make sure I can get some feedback from all three of you. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Brandon. So I think data for me is uh, maybe skewed toward the more researcher, founder, entrepreneur side. And I like to go and dig, not dig for data, but create the data. I try to take the, uh, like the newest machine learning or AI technologies, because like right now we have uh, natural language processing, we have computer visions, we have some other uh, technologies that can, we can produce new data that we never produced before. And many businesses, they don't, they have a lot of data. I, someone once told me if uh, an analogy about data is a new oil, he said, um, like data is a new oil, but when you dig up the oil, the valuable, the, what you get out of the ground, most of it is not valuable. They take small part that is valuable. And not only that, but we have to like, right now I'm working on a project that's, as Logan mentioned, it's been taking me months and months and I haven't done any machine learning. I was trying to generate the new data. So it's more experimental and there's a lot of, um, um, just looking at and the, the person who, who I, I interviewed someone who gave me a good perspective about finding new ways of finding data. And that person was uh, had a, a background in philosophy and computer science and mathematics. And that's a, this is a great job for, it relates to Ashwarya's uh, answer about like people who want to go out and find a new data. It's good to have someone with liberal arts, someone with like a phil phil philosophy, right? So I would say uh, data for me is lots of work to just generate these new forms of data, new sensors, and before even starting to plug it into the workflow or, or the um, infrastructure. So it's a, a lot of work and long-term work, so. I would, I would just, and sort of uh, to put a bow on it, I would also just say in my own experience, there's the constant need to reevaluate it and question the the data that you're currently ingesting to see if it's answering the question that maybe you didn't expect to have to answer and just to use a more practical example um something like for me continue watching for disney plus right we had data that was coming in that was telling us okay users are rolling into the next episode of a series and that's valuable at least to a degree because it's a measure of engagement. But then we thought to ourselves, we were looking at the data and we thought, right, but what if you fell asleep for like an hour and then you just rolled into another show? And the data that we're getting is, is skewing, our, not skewing our results, but it's leading us to believe that we are seeing this level of user engagement. But what if they didn't actually click play on the next episode? What if they just kind of let it roll in? So what we derived from that was a new data point that was effectively called user intent that more specifically measured whether or not a user took manual action to, <clears throat> to invoke the playback of what we're recommending. And that proved to be vastly more illuminating. And it wasn't something that we necessarily knew from the outset, but again, in always reevaluating, always questioning and sort of um, reassessing your underlying assumptions about the data you're getting in, um, I, I think that's such a huge part of it too. And I know we're at time, so... Um, I want to thank all of our panelists, Logan, Ashwarya, Muhammad, uh, SPS Student Life. Thank you for having us all. I don't know, SPS, is there anything you want to sort of close with? Yes, thank you everyone for joining. This was the first event. Um, it, thank you for the speakers and for Brandon for this awesome and engaging discussion. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't answer all the questions, but you have Logan's LinkedIn, and I'm sure Aiswarya and Muhammad can also be reached out to later after the panel as well, if you have more questions. 
Um, look forward to more events with Tiva. We'll share here our SPS Engage and our Instagram account as well for you to follow. Thank you everyone for joining um, and we hope you have a great day. Thank you everybody. Talk soon. Yeah, great job hosting Brandon. I appreciate this. It was a ton of fun. No, thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And it was great meeting Logan and Mohammed. So yeah, it's um, awesome to, you know, like connect with new folks every time we're having this session. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate you.